What is up, Thrive? We are back for Mark chapter 3. Here's what I need you to do. Press pause. Go grab a Bible or your phone. Read Mark chapter 3. It'll only take you like three or four minutes. Come back to this video so that we can get going and you know what's going on. Hey, a few years ago, my brother got married and he was getting married in Orlando, Florida. And I don't know if you know me, but I hate, 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 hate long drives. So I said, not doing it, getting on a plane, flying down there. The rest of my family drove, I flew by myself. So I'm in GSP and I'm about to get on my plane and they stop me and they're like, hey, um, actually we need, to read, we need you to read through this and sign on to something. You're gonna sit towards the front of the plane and we need you to read this manual and agree in signature that if the plane starts going down, you will help save all of the other people on the plane and like put their face masks on before you help yourself. And if you don't sign and agree, you can't get on this plane. End of story. Never got an email, never got a call, no one asked. They told me what I was doing and that I wasn't flying. So I was like, well, guess I gotta sign. So then that whole plane ride, I'm sitting there just like, Lord, please do not let this plane crash. Or I was thinking, Lord, if the plane crashes, please let it kill me so I don't go to prison, you know? <laughs> like, I just wanted to hop on my plane ride, get to where I was going, get the benefit of a plane ride, but I really didn't want to have to help anybody else. I think when we look at our lives as Christians, oftentimes we kind of do the same thing. That we want the benefits of Christianity, that we want to be saved, transformed, forgiven. Uh, we want to have God on our side and for him to help us and comfort us. We want to spend eternity with him. But when we realize that the Christian faith calls us to help other people, it's almost like we kind of freak out. Like almost like we're blindsided. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I did not sign up for this. Like, are you saying I got to go do something and help people and change the world? When the reality is that, well, yes, Christianity has always been not only about being saved and transformed, but about transforming the world. That we, we have a unique call and opportunity to see the world transformed in the light of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ, and he wants to work through us. And yes, there's always going to be opposition. Now, there's always going to be people who want to stop us. Maybe you're terrified about, about what people would think, how people are going to come after you or want to stop you or whatever it is because of the, the way you stand for Christianity. But the reality is, is that we're called, we're called to stand up, speak the truth, and change the world. And so that's why today we're looking at Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. So here's what's going on. Jesus begins Mark chapter 3 by healing a man with a withered hand. And after that, crowds from all over are pressing in on him and he's healing them demon possessed people are falling down on the ground and and crying out and saying we know who you are the son of god like jesus is taking authority over them like it is, it is crazy jesus is just going around just taking it to the devil you know what i mean healing people casting out demons is awesome but then Je jesus does something that's really important that i think we need to take a look at Jesus begins to create a brand new people. Here's what I mean. Jesus calls 12 apostles to himself. He calls 12 apostles. This is Jesus' inner crew. These are those people that are doing ministry with Jesus. He calls them to a mountain. And this is really important, and here's why. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, who were the people of God, had tribes. In fact, they had 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. These were the people of God. Well, as Jesus is forming his crew, he's, he picks a specific number of 12. And what Jesus is signifying is that Jesus has come to bring something new and that out of these 12 men, he is forming a brand new people of God. And just as he called 12 apostles to a brand new people of God, so he's calling the whole world to join in on that people of God. At the end of, of this chapter, chapter 3, Jesus says this, For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus is calling us to be his people, but also his family. Like Jesus is our older brother. God the Father is our father. We're joined to him by the Spirit. Like we're called to be in a 
family of God. Jesus is calling us to be a brand new family, but not just a family, a transformed family. When Jesus is listing off his apostles, he lists off a lot of the, the apostles whose names he actually changed. It says this, he appointed the 12 Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Sons of Thunder, which is an awesome nickname, by the way. I wish I could be a son of thunder. Like, that is sick. He mentions Matthew. Matthew's old name was Levi. Like, whenever someone has a name change, it, it signifies that, that God has transformed them and change them. Think about Saul, the persecutor of Christians, became Paul, who wrote half the New Testament. Jacob, who was kind of fighting God, eventually wrestled God and was renamed to Israel, which is now, you know, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. They were the people of God. That's where they got that name. Like whenever a new name happens, there's a transformation. And so Jesus has come to call us to be his people, but to be a transformed people. But not only that, Jesus has called us to be a new transformed people that go out and transform the world. It says that he, Jesus, went up on the mount and called to him those whom he desired and they came to him. And he appointed 12 whom he named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So Jesus calls these men so that they would be with him, close to him, part of his family, part of his crew, but also so that he would send them out to preach the good news and to defeat the devil, specifically through casting out demons. To preach good news and defeat the devil. The reason Jesus came is to conquer the devil. Is to conquer the, the dark parts of this world and of our lives. Jesus lived, died, and rose again so that we could be forgiven of our sins, cleansed of our sins, set free from sinfulness, and given eternal life. To, to conquer everything the devil had done. The author of Hebrews says Jesus died to destroy him who has the power of death, namely Satan. Like that's what Jesus came to do. But he's calling us to be transformed, to go back out into the world and, and, and to de defeat the devil through his power. And that call has been true for all of Christianity and today. That we aren't called just to go out there and cast out demons, but to find the dark broken, sinful, messed up part of, of this whole world and to shine on it the light and life of Christ and transform it. And Christians have always done this. Here's what I mean. Christians have always opposed abortion and they have fought for the rights of the unborn. I'm not talking about just in the 60s. I'm talking about in the Roman Empire way back in the 200s and 300s and 400s, they opposed abortion. When the Romans would leave unwanted babies outside the city to die, Christians would adopt the babies and raise them. Christians opposed slavery. There's a man in Great Britain in the 1700s called William Wilberforce who stood out against slavery in the name of Christianity and saw slavery abolished in Great Britain and America followed soon after relatively. Like, Christians were the ones who established universities to educate people. Like, did you know that Ivy League schools in America, think Harvard, many of them started off as seminaries to train, like, Christians and pastors? Christians have been the ones who have wanted to help the sick and broken. Like, we start hospitals all the time. In fact, in the 300s, a bishop, a pastor by the name of St. Basil the Great started, I'm pretty sure, the first Christian hospital, and we followed suit. I mean, even in the upstate, we've got Easley Baptist and St. Francis. Like, Christians have always taken the call to find the broken parts of this world, whether it's slavery, harm to the unborn, um, you know, education needs, health needs, and to shine the light of Christ on it and to transform it. And you and I are called to do the exact same thing. And so we can do this in two ways. We can do this on a large scale and on a small scale. So what about the large scale? As Christians, we should stand up against large injustices and dark parts of this world, like, for instance, abortion. Man, abortion kills millions of babies. 
millions. I mean, it is responsible for the death of millions of babies since it was legalized in the 60s or, or 70s, whenever Roe v. Wade was. And, and it's just evil. It's, it's, it's a detriment to our society. So what, you, what can you do? Well, you can stand up for the truth. You can get educated about abortion and know why you believe what you believe. And you can educate others about it. You can bring awareness. You can vote when you get old enough to vote and vote for policies and people that will stand against abortion and for the rights of the unborn. You can partner with organizations and donate money to them and volunteer with them that stand up against abortion. What about global injustice and poverty to our Christian brothers and sisters? I mean, did you know Christians were persecuted or are persecuted today more than ever? I mean, millions probably of Christians around the world are suffering persecution. We can partner with organizations like Open Doors USA, give them money, send them money so that Christians around the world can get shelter, food, freedom, protection, education, and everything else as they're being persecuted around the world. That, that we can stand up against human trafficking, against modern sex slavery, which is so evil. We can partner with A21 campaign and, and donate money to them so that we can see people set free. I mean, Christians are called to change the world and you can play a part. But what if you say, okay, Evan, like, Seriously though, I'm in middle school, like I don't really even make money, like I can't go volunteer with these organizations, like what should I do? Then you can start by just making a difference and being a Christian every day at school, around your friends and your family life. They can start with something as simple as this, don't join in in making fun of and bullying people, whether in person or online. Like just start by the basic premise of love your neighbor as yourself. And so when people at school go, you know, making fun of a certain group of people or certain kid or, or making themselves feel good at somebody's expense, stand up and, and don't join in. Say, that's not funny. I'm not doing that. I'm not dealing with that. Love that person. How about we, we learn to get along with unity and joy and peace with people we disagree with? That, that we don't fight and bicker and talk junk about people from a different race or religion or background or people we just think are weird or different interests or whatever, especially in the realm of political divide. Like, I don't know if you've caught wind of this yet. I don't know how political you are, but like politics drives people apart and it drives them crazy. Christians should be the ones setting the standards that we speak with people who think differently than us. And instead of calling them names and telling them that they're stupid and trashing them and, and being petty, that we respectfully discuss ideas, shake their hand, get along with them, and walk away. Doesn't mean you gotta like them, agree with everything they say, think all of their points are valid, good, or true. But it means that you can have a conversation with love and with respect. Man, we are called to be the light in this dark world and there is a lot of darkness. And just as Jesus stepped in and started healing and casting out demons and preaching truth, we should do the very same thing. I mean, heck, just spread the gospel, share Jesus, share your testimony, invite people to church, allow God to work through you to see somebody saved and transformed forever. Whatever we do, let's transform society and world with the life and light of Christ. But here's the reality. It's, it's true. There are always going to be people, whether it's individuals or organizations or groups of people or whatever, that want to stand against the truth, against Christian truth or way of life or morality or whatever, and fight against it. In fact, Jesus saw this in his day. Jesus is going around and he's casting out demons, but he's making the Pharisees mad. And the Pharisees hated him so much that they refused to admit that he was from God. When listen, in reality, they knew deep down he was doing the work of God. Of course, God would want to cast out Satan, the very antithesis of everything that he stands for. But they hated Jesus so much 
because they were sinful. Jesus was a threat to their money, to their selfishness, to their pride, to their self-righteousness and everything else that they hated him, that they could not admit, even though they knew it was true, that Jesus was doing the work of God. So you know what they did? They said that Jesus cast out demons because he was demon-possessed, which is ridiculous. So Jesus responds and says, look, obviously this isn't true. This is terrible logic. Like a kingdom would be coming to an end if it's divided against itself. Like if Satan is casting out Saint, Satan, that means it's game over for him. Like Satan is a loser, but he ain't that stupid. Like he hates God and he is going to continue to not cast out himself, but try and attack God with everything that he has. Two, Jesus says, I came into this world to bind Satan and to set people free from sin. He said, just like if you're going to steal from somebody's house and there's a strong man in there, first you have to bind the strong man and then you can take from his house. Jesus says, I have come to bind Satan, to bind his hands behind his back and set people free from sin through teaching, through healing, through exorcism, and ultimately through his life, death, and resurrection to set us free from sin. Jesus says, it's stupid. But then he says this, and this is what's so, so important. Verse 28, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, what does this mean? This right here has freaked out so many Christians who thought maybe at one time they blasphemed against the Holy Spirit and God will never forgive them and they're going to hell no matter how much they want to be a Christian and live their lives. Listen to me. Let me clarify. Here's what Jesus means. Jesus means that what the Pharisees were doing is that they were giving such an obvious, high-handed, willingly rejecting Jesus, even though that they knew the truth, with that there was no way that God was going to forgive them and be merciful to them because of that. And here's what I mean. That there's no way that the Pharisees could plead ignorance, that they didn't know better, that, that they had a small lapse of judgment in this moment, right? That they just kind of screwed up. No. No. In fact, the Pharisees knew the truth. They knew that he was from God. And they knew that the work that he was doing was a work of the Holy Spirit. And they looked at what they knew to be a true work of the Holy Spirit and attributed it to Satan simply because they hated Jesus and they wanted to reject him. And someone with such an outward, deliberate, high-handed rejection of Jesus will not be dealt mercy, but will be dealt judgment. Because they clearly said, we don't want you, Jesus, even though we know the truth. And so that is why Jesus says they're under an eternal sin, because that's what they've done. And church father, fathers have argued and said, but if they turned, then they would be forgiven. That's a whole different discussion. The point is, you got to really, really reject Jesus to experience this kind of judgment. If you're a Christian, you don't have to worry about this. But here's my point of the story, and it's this. It's that there were people, the Pharisees, who saw Jesus doing something good and right and moral in setting poor, broken people free from the bonds of Satan, and they hated him anyways. And just like those Pharisees, there are always going to be people in this world who although you stand for what is true and good and right, and although you do work to help people, and although you serve at nonprofits and give your money to organizations that help people across the world, though you stand for what is right, people will still hate you because you stand for what is good. It is Satan attacking the church, attacking Jesus, attacking Christianity because he hates what we stand for. Recently, I have been... Um, watching this documentary called The Last Dance, which is all about Michael Jordan and the 90s Bulls and that whole dynasty. Anyways, Jordan was one of these guys that if he could get motivated, if something could just tick him off, 
He would go crazy and play so good. So one night they play um, the Washington Bullets or Wizards, one of those. I can't remember what the franchise was. And there's a rookie. And the rookie played really good that night. Michael didn't play so good. So after the game, the rookie walks by and says, good game, Mike, and just kind of taunts him. Well, Michael Jordan comes out and says, next game, I'm going to drop in the first half what that kid scored all game. The next game, Michael Jordan went at this rookie on offense and defense, like attacked him, defended him the whole nine yards, and scored more, scored more points in the first half than that kid scored all game the previous game because of that kid's comment. Well, it came out later that that rookie never said it to Michael. He never talked junk to Michael. In fact, Michael Jordan made up the whole story to get himself motivated to play better the next game. So that whole game, that poor rookie was wondering, why in the world am I getting attacked? Why is he defending me so ferociously? Why is he coming at me when he has the ball every play? Why is the greatest player of all time have it out for me? I didn't do anything wrong. Like Jordan made the whole thing up. So that poor kid was probably so confused. In the same way as Christians, we will spend our lives fighting for what is right. And it will feel like when the opposition comes, we're going, why do people hate me? I'm only trying to do good. I'm only trying to help people and love God and love neighbor. I'm only trying to better the world. Why do people hate me so much? Why do they hate Christianity so much? What is going on? Man, when you live as a Christian, there will be individuals who hate you. There will be people at school that they just don't like you because the darkness hates the light. It's opposed to it. And when they see you living right, standing for what it's right, whether they, uh, excuse me, hear your moral position on anything, really, they may disagree with you and hate you. Man, you could be fighting for what's right and giving to good organizations and serving the poor and protecting the unborn. And there are going to be people out there who hate what you do. Organizations that want to shut down the way you protect the unborn or, or fight for traditional gender roles or fight for traditional marriage or whatever it is. And they're going to hate you. There's going to be people who are persecuting Christians always, even though they just want a better society. But here's the reality, is that Jesus kind of knew that was going to happen, and we should be prepared too. Jesus said, if they treated me bad, they're going to treat you bad. A servant isn't greater than his master. And Jesus is saying, I'm the master. If they treated me bad, you better get ready. And so we need to be prepared to know that we're going to fight for what's right and we're going to fight through opposition and continue to love the world no matter what. We've been promised people will come at us, but we're going to love anyways. Jesus died for those people that hated him. We're going to continue to love through that. But two, let's do everything we can to preach the gospel and soften the hearts of our enemies. Man, when Jesus healed the man with a withered hand, he called the man up front and he stood them in front of the Pharisees. And uh, the early church father, St. John Chrysostom, says that Jesus did this to soften the hearts of the Pharisees. That as they looked on the poor man, they looked on his broken state, his withered hand, his desire to be healed, maybe their hearts would be softened and that they would encourage Jesus to heal the man on the Sabbath. And in reality, they did it. But Jesus did it for them. And although people hate us, we're called to turn the other cheek, to bless our enemies, and to share the gospel with them. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. Never stop telling your story. Find the people that make fun of you. Continue loving them. Tell them about how Jesus saved you. Never be ashamed of the gospel. Openly share it, spread it, represent it, no matter what. Never be ashamed of how Jesus has saved you, but stand up for the truth and love through it. And finally, and I know this may seem backwards to some of you, it's okay to feel a righteous anger and grievance at the opposition of this world. When the Pharisees refused to answer whether or not Jesus should heal the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath, it says that Jesus was angered and he grieved in his heart. Now, Jesus was without sin. That means that we can be angry 
but without sin. And when we look at the brokenness of this world, the evil people in this world, those who want to stop Christianity and the good that we do, the individuals who will hate you for no reason, it will anger us. When we look at the brokenness and the sinfulness that people kill children, that people kill babies, that people enslave innocent children, that people kill Christians, whole families for no reason, that so much bad and darkness is in this world, we can be righteously angry and grieved at what happens. But instead of letting it lead to violence and sin and brokenness, we should get up and love through it. Love the world. Love our enemies. Love those who oppose us, oppose us just like Jesus. That as he died on the cross for the world, we will sacrifice for the good of this world because we are called to be light in life just like Jesus. So here's my encouragement to you. You've been called out to a new people and a new family. You've been transformed. Go transform the world. I love you, Thrive, and I can't wait to see you again.